Okay. Okay, so my name is Michael King from Massachusetts Family Institute, and I am joined again uh, by Barbara and Michaela from uh, Patients' Rights Action Fund, a national organization that is fighting um, opposing physician-assisted suicide, and um, they gave a fantastic presentation last Thursday to pastors that were on the training. Uh, this, why are we doing this? Because there is currently pending legislation in Massachusetts, like there has been for several years, uh, to pass physician-assisted suicide. And so we're going to go over reasons why we, we feel so strongly to oppose this piece of legislation. And as I always like to say, uh, be encouraged, be encouraged, even in Massachusetts, uh, last year, we worked with uh, Patients' Rights Action Fund to defeat physician-assisted suicide in Massachusetts. Um, and, and one of the uh, great ways we were able to do that was partnering with 80 minority pastors in Massachusetts that, that wrote letters um, and spoke to their legislators on a, on a local level to say, we don't want this in Massachusetts, and you'll understand more of why we don't want this today. So for those of you that are joining us, we had a great crowd last Thursday and um, have some more people coming in now too as well to, to listen in. So Barbara and Michaela, uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Michael. It's really a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, I need to stop this, whoops. Okay, there's a push to legalize assisted suicide in the United States at this particular time. It's a very vibrant push. Uh, proponents of assisted suicide have a large amount of money. They have very generous donors that are giving them millions of dollars. And we depend on groups like you, you, you and ours to essentially turn back the tide so that Massachusetts does not be, is not added to the column of states that have now legalized assisted suicide. So the main proponent organization is called Compassion and Choices. It was formerly called the Hemlock Society. It merged with several other groups and it is now uh, the main player in this particular area. And again, as I stated, it has a very, very large war chest and it spends very generously in the states. And this group has targeted Massachusetts for this year. They believe they can pass assisted suicide in your state this year. The goals of the proponents of assisted suicide are to legalize it in every state, to normalize the use of lethal drugs as part of medical practice, to expand the practice further by allowing doctor prescribed suicide and, and euthanasia in circumstances beyond terminal illness, to ensure that 50% of the US population has access to lethal drugs in 10 years, and they, they're very slow and steady. They never give up. They, they come back year after year after year. Uh, sometimes it's taken them 10, 12 years to legalize assisted suicide in a specific state, but they, they're committed to it and they will come back. They've been in Massachusetts going all the way back to your referendum. So they've been in Massachusetts for a long time. Here's some uh, background on the issue. Uh, assisted suicide is legal in Oregon, Washington State, and Colorado, a ballot initiative by Vermont, California, District of Columbia, Iowa, Iowa, Hawaii, Maine, New Jersey, and now New Mexico, and by litigation in Montana. In other words, the Supreme Court gave the authority for it to be uh, practiced in Montana. Here's a map that shows kind of the overall picture. Again, we have got New, Ma New Mexico in the wrong color because it just was enacted last, signed into law last week. But you can see the red states are the ones where it has been legalized. West Coast, Colorado, and then a, a group of states on the East Coast. Uh, the blue states show and, and green states show states where assisted suicide is prohibited. So we do have a strong case against assisted suicide across the country. But again, they're just picking us off one state at a time. What does the Massachusetts bill say? Well, the patient has to be 18 years of age and a resident of the state to request lethal drugs. There has to be a diagnosis of terminal illness, six months to live with or without treatment. And that last statement is really important because if you have someone that has an illness that can be treated 
and they stop taking their medication, well, then they become terminal. So then they're eligible for the um, lethal drugs. There have to be two or more separate requests with waiting periods in between. Two witnesses can sign to the request, but they may have a conflict of interest. For example, one could be an heir to the person's estate. They have a conflict of interest. Could be a, 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 an abusive caregiver that just really wants to be rid of the patient. They have a conflict of interest, but they can, they can witness the request. There's no in-person consultation required. What this means is it can be done over a screen like we're doing right now. The person can be assessed for their physical, mental situation. A diagnosis can be made that there's six months to live. It could be someone from out of state that's, tele that's communicating into your state, essentially uh, telling this person that they are eligible and in, in writing the lethal prescription. No in-person consultation is required. There's no meaningful mental health evaluation. We know that a lot of people that want to die are depressed and depression is treatable, but there's nothing in the legislation that, that allows for a meaningful evaluation of the patient to see if they really, really want this lethal drug prescription. The drugs must be self-administered and that has some problems too because uh, the lethal drugs that are used is a combination of medications and someone usually has to repair it for the patient. So while it has to be self-administered, they still have to have someone's help in, in order to commit suicide. Then they falsify the death certificate and say that the underlying illness is the cause of death instead of the real cause of death, which was the ingestion of lethal drugs. And there's broad immunity for prescribers. They just, uh, there are very few avenues to investigate a suspicious death they're really protected by the way the law is written. And it violates the consciences of medical professionals by requiring them to refer. In other words, they, they're forcing medical people to participate in the practice, even though they do not want to do so for conscience reasons. The proponents claim that there are no abuses. That's one of their biggest uh, arguments is that, uh, well, we've had this for 20 years in Oregon and they talk about an accumulation of 50 years. If you look at all the states that have legalized and they say there's not been a single instance of abuse. Well, of course, the way they write the laws, they make it very uh, difficult to investigate or to find out what is actually going on. Here are some of the abuses that we've documented. Denial of treatment and payment for lethal drugs. This is a situation where Stephanie Packer, a young California mother who needed um, some expensive chemotherapy for her illness, was denied that payment for those that treatment. When she asked, well, what about assisted suicide? And they said, oh yes, we can provide that for you at $1.20 copay. Barbara Wagner was an Oregon resident, same uh, situation, she needed some advanced chemotherapy that was expensive. She received a letter from the department, State of Oregon Health Department that said, uh, no, we're denying payment of this treatment, but we will pay for your assisted suicide. Now, she didn't even, she did not request the assisted suicide drugs, but they were offering to pay for them instead of her treatment. Randy Strupp, also from Oregon, he had the same situation as Barbara Wagner. State of Oregon sent him a letter, said, no, we are not going to pay for your chemotherapy, but we'll pay for your assisted suicide drugs, something that he had never requested. Then we have Dr. Brian Callister, who is a Nevada physician with patients in California and Oregon. And on two separate occasions, he requested from the patient's insurance companies coverage of some pretty routine life-saving treatment. And in both cases, the director, of, uh, the medical director said, no, we're not going to pay for that treatment. But did you think about assisted suicide? Because we'll pay for that. Again, the patient had never requested the drugs. The doctor was not interested in them, but the insurance company readily agreed to deny treatment and to pay for the lethal drugs. So this is one of the big uh, problems that we have with this legislation is that it's going to be very easy for insurance companies and for um, states to say, well, this is a way we can save some money. We'll just pay for the lethal drugs and not for the treatment these people are requesting. There's also instances of doctor shopping. What this means is if you go to say your doctor and they uh, say, no, I don't think you're qualified and I'm not gonna, not gonna write the prescription when you just hop from doctor to doctor till you find someone that will write the prescription. And what we found in other states is that compassion and choices, that there, first of all, there are very few doctors, even though it's legal in some of these states, very few doctors that are actually writing the prescriptions. 
but they have it set up so that doctors that are aligned with compassion and choices are readily available. And so the person can go to the, one of the compassion and choices doctors and get the prescription written, even though this is not their doctor, someone that has not followed them throughout their uh, illness. And sometimes, and usually a, a doctor that isn't even qualified to treat them based on their, uh, their condition. We also have patients that are not dying. Uh, JJ Hansen was a young father diagnosed with uh, a very serious brain cancer. He was told he had four months to live to put his affairs in order and he refused to listen. Went through a really difficult, difficult time where he said if the assisted suicide drugs had been available, he might've taken them. But he, he sought treatment and he lived for almost four, uh, uh, four more years and created wonderful memories with his son, gave birth to a second son. So again, people are shortening their lives well when they still have a lot of wonderful months and years to live. Sarah Steele, same way. She had a, a, a serious cancer, was told she had months to live, and she's alive probably 10 years later. Jeanette Hall is even more extreme because she was living in Oregon. She wanted the assisted suicide drugs, asked for them, and her physician has said, uh, recommended that she undergo treatment, which she did, and she is now alive 20 years later and is so happy that she listened to the doctor, accepted the treatment. She's glad to be alive. We have to be concerned about patient coercion and abuse because not every patient has a loving family. And we all know that. We know that elders, 10% uh, of elders are abused at this particular time. That's a, a statistic that's well known. Medical professionals have power due to knowledge and can, they can pressure a decision to ask for lethal drugs. There's no physician or medical professional present when the medication is taken. So no one knows at that time whether the person, it could be months later, it could actually be a few years later because people outlive their diagnoses. And um, no one is present at that time to, see, to know if the patient's mental health is still what it should be to make such a decision. Uh, you could have, again, the greedy heir or the abusive caregiver who could essentially give the patient the medication without their knowledge. So that's coercion and abuse. And these, these uh, way these bills are written, it allows for that. There's, it doesn't protect patients from this type of behavior. And again, you have the greedy heir or the abusive caregiver who could be part of this coercion process. The drug is supposed to be self-administered, but uh, again, someone has to help prepare the drugs because it's not a simple procedure. Right now they're using a kind of a series of drug cocktails and it would be I think difficult for a patient himself or herself to prepare the drugs in order to get uh, have them ready to be self-administered. Again, there's a lack of meaningful patient assessment. The doctor doesn't even have to be a specialty in the patient's illness. Depression and hopelessness are best predictors for a, a desired haste and death and request, and this can be treated. And again, there's no supervision at the time the drugs are taken. The reporting from states that have legalized assisted suicide is very inadequate uh, and the records are destroyed after one year so that if you think that there's a suspicious death, first of all, it's almost impossible to get a hold of the records, but also they've been destroyed. So you have no basis upon which to uh, ask for an investigation or report a suspected death or have someone uh, taken to authorities because they essentially were did not follow the law and per perhaps even caused the patient's death. So the authorities are unable to investigate because of this lax reporting and the Massachusetts proposed law would be the same way. Protection for those prescribing drugs. Again, the doctors and anyone that's involved, they're generally immune from any type of civil or criminal uh, activity so that you couldn't even sue a doctor if you, if you were able to even prove that something had taken place, there's no ability to sue them because they're immune. And then as reported, the death certificate is falsified so that uh, the patient can collect insurance or annuities because uh, they would not be eligible if it, their death was a suicide. So they, they falsified, it's actually required that the death certificate be falsified. Proponents use pain as their, as their weapon of choice to essentially get the public to agree that this is really a good idea. Now, who, which, who of us would want to be in pain or want our loved ones to be in pain? We, we don't want that. So they use pain and they, they have uh, a lot of emotional testimony, which again, you don't want to take it lightly when people are, are really suffering from uh, something they've experienced or witnessed. You don't want to undermine their 
their, uh, their experience. But when you really look at the statistics, pain is not the reason why patients are requesting drugs. They're, they're requesting them for really disability related reasons, loss of autonomy, less able to engage in activities, loss of dignity, burden on family. This is a big one. Patients really feel that they're a burden on family and friends or losing control of bodily functions. So these are the main reasons why patients are requesting lethal drugs in the states where it's legal. Inadequate pain control of concern is about it is only about 21%. So again, the main driver is pain and pain is not the reason why people are requesting the lethal drugs. There's something we call suicide contagion, which means that if you promote suicide, then more suicides will occur because it's appealing to someone who is, con who is uh, contemplating it. So when we look at Oregon, which has had assisted suicide the longest, they had a 49% increase in suicides in the, just the general public, not assisted suicide in the general public as compared to a 28% national increase. Now 28 is just unacceptable, but 49 is pretty outrageous. Uh, there was a 6.3% 6 3, 6 increase in total suicide and no decrease in non-assisted suicides. And Oregon veteran suicides account for 16% of the state's total suicides. So we see a pattern in Oregon where when you essentially say that, that suicide is a good for some people, then others say, well, if it's a good for them, it's probably a good for me. And you essentially incentivize suicide and you see this increased suicide rate. Uh, talking about the uh, drugs, for many years, they used a barbiturate called Secanol, which essentially put the patient, the patient to sleep. But in the last two years, Secanol has become very, very expensive and also not available for uses in assisted suicides. So the proponents of, um, of assisted suicide went to work and they're now, now concocting these drug cocktails. They're really bizarre. Uh, they're a combination of barbiturates, drugs that stop the heart, um, uh, drugs that have a, a sedating effect, and they're experimenting on patients. And they've had three or four different cocktails that they've tried on real people with some very bad results. Uh, some of them have, take, have resulted in throats burning of patients, putting them into pain. Some of them, uh, the drug cocktails essentially, the, it takes longer for death to occur, up to three or four days in some patients. And there's no oversight of the, the use of these drugs. First of all, they're not approved for this use. And secondly, they're there's no patients that is going on in every state that's legalized assisted suicide at this time because this drug is no longer available. And I spoke about the complications from the cocktails. And again, someone has to mix these cocktails and they have to be given in a certain order. So it's, it's not really something that the patient himself or herself can easily do. And that's why someone essentially helps them even though the drugs are supposedly self-administered. So in order to speak to your legislator or your, to your congregations or to your family and friends, we think it's a good idea to having to have some talking points in your back pocket. And these are documented on a sheet that we sent to you prior to this, um, this training session. So we're just gonna go through them real quickly. Some of them are gonna be a little repetition of what the information we just gave you, but here are the seven important reasons to oppose. And this is the way you can talk about it. Will insurance companies do the right thing or the cheap thing? Assisted suicide gives insurance companies and governments the authority to save money by pushing lethal drugs that are less expensive than life-saving treatment, as has happened in Oregon, California. One of the founders of assisted suicide, Derek Humphrey said, economics, not the question of broadened liberties or increased autonomy, will drive assisted suicide to the plateau of acceptable practice. And otherwise he recognizes that saving money is going to be the thing that's going to become the, the uh, foundation for broadening assisted suicide. The Canadians, they went one, one step further and they actually put out a report that said Canada, and, and Canada, by the way, went from assisted suicide to euthanasia, uh, terminal ill to now mentally ill in just like a, a, heart, a, a few years. They've just run down the path so that many, many patients in Canada that are not even terminally ill are, can have lethal drugs available to them and they practice more assisted, more euthanasia than assisted suicide in Canada. But in any event, um, in Canada, officials, in an official report, they estimated that um, they could reduce spending 
because the uh, the care is between 34.7 million and 138.8 .8 million for care compared to 1.5 million to 14.8 million spent on lethal drugs. So they really saw this as a cost saving measure. Mental health issues, issues may be ignored. Only 4% of the 1,657 patients who die by assisted suicide in Oregon since its legalization were referred for psychiatric evaluation. So again, no meaningful mental health evaluation. This is someone that wants to end their life and we're doing it without a serious evaluation of the patient for their mental health. And again, these can be done over telehealth. So they're not even with the patient in person. Pain is not the reason that people request it. We went through this before, but this is something that, that's very important to tell people about, loss of autonomy, less able to engage in activities, loss of dignity, burden on family and friends, losing control of bodily functions. These are all disability re related issues. And this is why the disability community is so opposed to assisted suicide because they see that almost an attack on their life and how they have to live it because they do lose autonomy they can't engage in a lot of activities. They are they feel they're a burden on family and they lose control of bodily affection. So these are disability related concerns. A six month prognosis for death is extremely difficult to predict accurately. With many patients living far beyond the six months. A major study in Chicago said that of, of um, 468 predict predictions, only 20% were accurate. Another one said it was only accurate 50% of the time. So I think that this is something that pretty much everyone can relate to because we all know of people, family members, friends, acquaintances, people in your churches who were told they had a certain amount of time to live and far outlived those predictions, or perhaps they lived a shorter amount of time. But some people are alive for years after they've been told they only have a few months to live. And that was again in some of those examples we gave you in, in uh, earlier. Patients who are not dying can get the drugs. Well, how does this happen? So um, the definition of terminal illness in the Massachusetts bill and in the laws that were passed talks about the patients that being eligible, even if they refuse treatment and might live for a long time. So example, diabetes has been listed as a reason why someone requested lethal drugs. If a diabetic patient doesn't take his or insulin, then they contagion. Again, the CDC report that reveals that uh, in Oregon, there was a 49% increase in suicides in the general public as compared to 28% nationally. Patients might be abused right through the, to the last minute. There's no trained medical personnel required to be present at the time the drugs are taken or at the time of death creating the opportunity for an error abusive caregiver to coerce the patient to take the deadly drugs or put them in the patient's food without the patient's knowledge or consent. We also know that Blacks, Indigenous, and people of color reject assisted suicide. And I think this is important for, uh, particularly for the pastors in your group with the minority communities. Um, looking at it state by state in Oregon, who is requesting assisted suicide? White, non-Hispanic white, 96.3, Hispanic 2%, black zero, Asian one, and so on. So you see the high percentage, it's the white population that is requesting the lethal drugs. In Washington, it was 96% white. In Colorado, 96% white, 2% Hispanic. In California, 87% white, 4% Hispanic, and then you have some black and Asian. In Massachusetts, when you had your referendum in 2012, if you look at the communities that are majority white, that would be the orange line, they're the ones that voted in favor of legalization. Schutzbury, Northampton, uh, again, 88% of the white population voted in favor. If you look at some of the uh, districts that have minority communities, then you see it switches that the Hispanic black communities voted against in Lawrence and Springfield counties. A Pew Research poll essentially assessing the issue by race showed that Black and Hispanic people are opposed to assisted suicide as opposed to white people. So we want to organize meetings with the legislators and share. I, I want to go back to that last slide for just a minute. 
what people in the black community think is that um, the, the way they see this issue is that there are already disparities in health care for them in that they're not able to get the health care that they believe that they deserve and need. And now there's going to be this extra burden or incentive to deprive them of health care in favor of other people's wanting this autonomy to have lethal drugs. So they see it in that reverse situation. I think that's important, an important concern to share. So we want to organize meetings with legislators and want, want you to share your concerns about assisted suicide, again, with your congregations. And then we'll be working with Michael to see if we can get you to talk to some legislators in your area, because we need to turn, we're very, very afraid of what's going to happen in Massachusetts. We think there's a real uh, danger here that they will legalize assisted suicide in the state. And we need your help. 